All right, I think we'll get going. Hi, everyone. Welcome to League of Women Voters April Lunch and Learn program. I'm Robin Schmidt, president of the League of Women Voters of the Cross area. Thank you for joining us today to hear from three guests who are going to talk about actions being taken in the Cooley region that reduce contributions to climate change pollutants or mitigate climate change impacts. Before we start the program, we've got a little bit of business to conduct as we usually do. Um, first, I want to thank um, Mary Nugent, who uh, has led our program committee for this past year. We've had amazing speakers and amazing, uh, amazingly successful programs, and Mary put a lot of time and thought and effort into pulling this all together for us. And I just want to recognize her, her efforts in that. So thank you, Mary. Um, it's been a really good year. I also want to take a minute to thank all the candidates who ran for the various positions in our recent election. Our democracy doesn't work without candidates willing to put themselves out there and run for public office. I also want to commend the voters who practice democracy um, and actually voted. And I want to thank all the lead volunteers who worked so hard to help educate voters, um, including Martha Linville and her team who managed the Vote 411 candidate information platform. Uh, Chris Haskell, who organized and led the Voter Services Committee, um, and Ellen France, who organized candidate forums, and so many more who spent hours on these and other efforts um, on behalf of the League and to help uh, with our elections. Susan Anthony said, someone struggled for your right to vote, use it. And the La Crosse area heeded her advice and had an impressive turnout for a spring election, and in some places they reached up to 40% and even over 40% turnout, which is really impressive. I also want to note that the Clean Water uh, Advisory Referendum was supported by 86% of the voters, which is, I think, the highest percentage of any county yet who had this as an advisory referendum. So it just goes to show you how important water is um, in our community. And while the spring elections are over, um, the election year isn't. And so we will continue to work um, on getting information out on the upcoming primaries and in the fall election. So to, um, as we typically have at our programs, um, Ellen France has agreed to give us a brief update on court and legislative issues um, relating to our voting rights. Ellen, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, just a couple of things. There are um, two um, matters still pending in our Wisconsin Supreme Court. Uh, the first is the ultimate decision um, about uh, using drop boxes and the issue that came up with during the primary with people not being able to vote, maybe because they didn't have somebody able to carry a ballot or an absentee ballot to the mailbox or to the clerk or what have you. So those still are pending. Um, obviously, they didn't deal with it, in my opinion, very well before the April election because they didn't have those things resolved. Um, and I suppose one way or another, they'll have it resolved before the August primary. Um, the other one is a redistricting case, which has landed back in our Wisconsin Supreme Court. You may have seen that the United States Supreme Court in uh, what the, basically what they call a shadow docket without much fanfare or much for opinions, um, sent it back um, with a question about whether there was enough evidence supporting uh, the additional um, majority black district that was in the Evers plan. So that came back. Um, the governor asked for permission to supplement the record in case they, the Wisconsin Supremes needed more information as they reviewed that decision. And by order on April 1st, they denied that request. Um, Congressional districts are okay. So a district that Ron Kine represented and other districts like that throughout the state are not uh, subject to change at this point. Although I understand the Republicans did um, request a reconsideration on that issue from the United States Supreme Court. What still is up in the air are the state assembly districts. Those have not been set. We're waiting on the court to tell us what, what they're gonna do. Um, and it's uh, important because nomination papers can be circulating starting April 15th, two days away. So they may issue a decision by that um, one way or the other. 
but anybody running, even though it's in our area, they have some questionable areas that they, they're either in or out, depending on what map is ultimately selected. In addition to those things pending, we have the Gableman investigation that's still open, still continuing. I've read that uh, there's been some indication that uh, Robin Voss may uh, end it before the end of April, um, but uh, right now it's it's still there. I mean, we don't have any new information, um, but it's still out there and pending. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen uh, for a minute here. Um, as many of you know, our April program is focused on environmental issues. And I want to um, extend a great deal of thanks to Nora Garland, who recently um, updated our website to include uh, a new page focused on environmental issues. Um, and so I'd like to just uh, introduce this to you. Um, we have a tab here on the top of our screen um, that has, uh, it says engage on issues. And there's a, if you go to the third button down, it's the environmental issues, and you'll get to the screen that I'm on here. Um, and uh, like our website, we have banners. So if you scroll down, you can see the banners um, that we have. Uh, I think a beautiful picture of the, of the planet Earth. Um, the next banner is lead positions on the environment. And you can click and look at the informational papers from the state lead and from US lead. Um, and then if you scroll down a little bit further, we have our recent program on the Clean Water Now referendum. And then there's also um, an area that will keep updated on environmental news. And then the next banner down is focused on the Upper Mississippi River Region um, Interleague Organization. Um, so you can see a map of what that league is. Um, Carolyn Jenkins is going to talk um, in just a minute, uh, give us an update on what the um, Upper Mississippi River um, Region League is doing. Um, and I wanted to also, if you scroll down just a little bit further, um, you'll see that um, there are links to their website, to their blog and annual meeting information, and to subscribe to their newsletter. And then their live Facebook page um, is also here. Um, you can see what posts they have, um, and that's updated as they update their Facebook page. So that's a, a pretty nice feature um, that we're happy to share with you all. And then at the end, we just have a listing of what we call environmental advocates, our friends who work hard on different um, areas of environmental advocacy. And so we just have links to their websites. And um, I, I'm, I, this is a brand new web page, so we may be adding more to this. Um, but this was what we had, um, at least as our initial debut for the, for the website um, on environmental issues. Um, so Carolyn, why don't I go ahead and turn it over to you. Carolyn Jenkins has been a longtime league member and she is our representative on what we call Hummer. If you hear that acronym, that's, that's how we pronounce it. Um, so um, thank you for giving us a quick update on what's going on with Hummer. Thanks for adding us to your website like that. That's really handy. Our interleague organization consists of local leagues in the states of Iowa, Illinois, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. We're all located in the upper Mississippi region. We're made up of about 60 plus local leagues. And it starts from the headwaters of Atasca State Park and goes all the way down to Cairo, Illinois, where the Ohio River enters in. Our focus has been to um, educate and ourselves as well as the public about nutrient pollution reduction and contaminants in the water and also about the impact of climate change on our water resources. We are concerned about both surface water and groundwater in the upper Mississippi. More than 20 million people rely on the basin for their drinking water, and it is at the heart of a hundred billion a year resource for recreation-based economy and it employs more than 1.5 million Americans. We also can't forget how important it is to us for enjoying bird migration and our Native American cultural heritage. How do we do this? We learn and educate ourselves about water quality issues. 
and then we work with local leagues. Then we partner with like-minded organizations to support one another and to also expand our scope. And then we meet with state, local, and national governmental representatives to express our concerns and also to partner with their legislation by informing the public. If you can take us to the screen that um, has our annual meeting, I just wanted to highlight a couple speakers or panelists that will be coming on May 21st. One of our first um, panelists is gonna be Brant Thorington. He's the policy director for Mississippi River Cities and Towns Initiative. And I think you remember this organization developed when Tim Cabot was our mayor. Right now it's made up of a coalition of mayors representing more than a hundred communities along the Mississippi. And what um, Brant is gonna be talking about is safeguarding the Mississippi River Together, it's an act that will be um, creating a federal program that manages the environment, the economic and infrastructure issues along the entire Mississippi River system. And it will be similar to um, the Great Lakes restorative initiative that's been going on. And also just to give you a little piece of information, Mitch Reynolds was in Washington, DC, this last May at the Mayor's Caucus, and he's jumping right in where Tim Cabot left off. So that's encouraging. The other presenters will be Alicia Vesto. She's a Water Program Associate Director from Iowa Environmental Council. And she's gonna be talking to us about the Mississippi River Restoration and Resilience Re Initiative. That started probably about um, two to three years ago, actually, uh, and um, Congresswoman <laughs> Betty McCulloch from Minnesota uh, brought this initiative forth about two years ago. She's introduced it and it is building momentum. The other presenter will be Laura Bryant and she is gonna be talking to us about the Farm Bill. And then Kristen Wallace, the Executive Director of the Upper Upper Mississippi River Basin Association will be talking about her organization and the, what they've been doing for the Upper Mississippi River since about 1980, when the governor started this program. As far as what we're gonna be doing this coming year, 2022-2023, we are very concerned about um, water quality issues and that impacting water quantity so we are going to be looking at, at um, whether the Mississippi River Basin may want something like a water compact. And this is an issue that we'll do research on and we'll meet with other organizations, we'll meet with other people before we move forward. But that's, as far as what's happening in Wisconsin, if you're not all lobbied out and exhausted um, tonight, you can join the Wisconsin Conservation Congress on a virtual meeting and express your concerns about the Natural Resource Board. And then April 15th, there's gonna be a deadline for providing comment to DNR's environmental impact statements for the Endred Bridge Line 5 that's going through the Northern part of Wisconsin. So there's always things going on and there's always things you can do. That's it. Thank you, Carol, and really appreciate the update. And thanks for your participation and leadership um, on Elmer. We really value that, um, your commitment to that, and it's a great organization. So thank you. So on to today's program. Um, I want to remind everyone that this program is being recorded, and a link to it will be on our website in a few days. If you have questions for the speakers, please type them into the question box located at the bottom of your screen. We will monitor that and leave time at the end for um, some discussions and uh, questions. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization. We encourage the informed and active participation of citizens in, citizens in government. We work to increase understanding of major public policy issues and influence public policy through education and advocacy. 
So after I introduce the speakers, they're each going to have about 15 minutes for their presentations. And when the presentations are over, we'll have time for questions and answers um, after that. Um, because climate change continues to be a global challenge, we wanted to share with you three perspectives, initiatives, and actions that are being taken in our own backyard that help mitigate or reduce inputs and uh, that contribute to climate change. Dave Petrano is a retired DNR biologist um, who spent 30 years significantly improving the streams and fish populations in the Driftless area, uh, increasing the region's classified trout stream waters and reintroduce, reintroducing uh, native brook trout. He studied land use impacts on streams, um, including cover crops and practices that prevent erosion. In his retirement, Dave's focused on what's called managed grazing, which uses land in a natural way to keep agricultural sustainable and improve soil, water quality, and stream flow at the same time. Dave's also director for organizations, including the School for Beginning Dairy and Livestock Farmers at UW-Madison, Grassworks, and the Dairy Grazing Apprenticeship Program. Rob Tyser, his professional interests are in conservation biology and environmental science. He's been a longtime member of the Mississippi Valley Conservancy. Rob retired from the biology department at UW La Crosse in 2015 and has been active in various sustainable related organizations in the La Crosse community. Some of his fondest memories are of southeastern Nebraska, where he spent time on his grandparents' small farm and developed a lifelong interest in nature. Jared Greeno is the city of La Crosse wastewater uh, superintendent, and he's responsible for managing the wastewater treatment plant, 205 miles of sanitary sewer collection system, 26 sanitary sewer lift stations. He also manages stormwater operations, which includes flood mitigation. So he's got a bit of work to do. Um, he's been in this position for the past 11 years. Prior to that, he served as the assistant superintendent. And before working for the city, he worked for the village of Coleman for 10 years, getting experience in all different aspects of public works. He grew up on a dairy farm in Kendall, Wisconsin, he was an owner operator of a dairy farm for 10 years. And he enjoys spending time with his family, returning to his brother's farm, hunting, winemaking, and he restores and shows antique tractors. And I saw a picture of one of them, they're amazing. So um, it's nice to, nice to see that diversity of interest there. Um, so Dave, we're gonna go ahead and start with you, then we'll go to Rob and then we'll go to Jared. And I'm going to screen share um, slides for you. You want me to start that now? Sure, go right ahead, thank you. All right, let's see if I can do it. There, how's that? Perfect. Thank you. Um, I want to just give a quick history of the land use because we really can't talk about where we're going till we talk about where we've been. And as you know, we live here in the Driftless area, uh, which is a major portion of Wisconsin, Minnesota, a little bit of Iowa, and another little bit of Illinois. And it is the unglaciated portion of the region. There is no evidence, certainly, that the last glacier ever entered here uh, or the, any of the glaciers uh, previously. Uh, next slide. The, uh, at the time of the European settlement, which was really in the 1820s, most of this area was characterized as tall grass prairie and oak savanna. Much of it was kept uh, open by the fires that were set by the indigenous people at the time uh, to allow for better hunting through increased um, uh, planting materials. Uh, next slide. The, uh, because it's in the unglaciated portion of the, the country or the state, we literally have no natural lakes. We, however, have literally thousands of miles of spring fed streams. And these streams, uh, spring temp temperatures or spring temperatures run 48 degrees all year round. And that 48 degrees is the average of the winter temperatures and the summer temperatures that we have. Next slide, please. At the time of settlement, these streams were very narrow, very deep, uh, crystal clear, and very cold. Next slide. Uh, 
and they were full of brook trout. Uh, those of you who know about brook trout, brook trout are what we call would call an indicator species, and they indicate absolutely uh, pure and crisp, uh, uh, pure and pristine water. Uh, when you find brook trout, then you know water quality is good. So for any watershed, if you want to know what the health of a watershed is, go down and look at the nearest water body, and uh, it'll tell you a lot about what's going on in the watershed. But brook trout were the uh, the, the predominant fish species in these streams. And there's no evidence that the Native Americans in any of the nations actually used them as a food source. Many of them considered uh, them to be sacred because of their uh, the beautiful colors that they that they have. Next slide. Um, the agriculture, although the area was settled in the 1820s, it wasn't until the advent of the moldboard plow in the 1850s uh, that agriculture became an industry in the driftless area. The moldboard plow was able to break down through the thick sod layers of the prairie sod to get down to the, to the lus or the fertile lus soil, that's L-O-E-S-S. -S. That soil is the wind-driven material that came off the glaciers during the glaciation period. Uh, wheat was the first crop and it was the crop that they were most familiar with. Most of the settlers in this area came from uh, Northern Europe uh, and they brought with them their, that technology. Uh, dairy didn't become a main industry until the 1880s as better wheat areas settled to the West and it still remains the main industry today. Next slide. Unfortunately, with the technology that they brought, although they were good farmers, the technology that they brought was inappropriate for this area. They uh, used the ridge tops and the valleys for up and down farming with uh, row cropping, and they grazed the, the hillsides. And in, in the grazing of the hillsides, you had two things that happened, denuding of the vegetation and complete compacting of the, the soil to uh, prevent infiltration of of uh, rainwater and snow melt. Next slide. Within a short time, uh, a process called rills form, which are small little grove gullies, and then those became head cuts. And then they actually formed large gullies that started from the ridge tops and went all the way down into the valleys. Next slide. and culminated in what we would consider today to be small canyons. Uh, erosion rates were 2 million tons per year. Most of the watersheds were considered to be um, uh, heavily grazed. There was only about 2% that were considered to be ungrazed or un, uh, unfarmed woodlots, and that's just because they were so steep they couldn't get to them. Erosion rates were 2 million tons per year, and uh, this process caused a lot of uh, soil erosion to enter down into the streams. The lust soil has a consistency of melted ice cream when it gets uh, when it gets wet and so it's fairly fluid and able to move. Next slide. So by the mid 13 or by mid 1930s, 12 to 15 feet of sediment had eroded off the hillsides and deposited all these major watershed. So if you go down through the Kickapoo, the flat ground that you see on both sides of 131 are topsoil down to a depth of 15 feet that once was up on top of the ridge tops. Next slide. Not surprisingly, the streams that were destroyed, the, what we uh, call uh, an embraiding of the system happened where they lost their defined channel. The streams became very wide, very shallow. And as a result, all the in-stream habitat was lost, water temperatures increased, and brook trout were extirpated and were replaced by species we more associate with warm water, chubs, suckers, carp, things like that, green sunfish. Next slide. Um, there, although there were seasonally from the 1930s through the 1970s and into the 80s, uh, because there are seasonally cold water temperatures in the spring, the streams were stocked with uh, domestic strain fish, brook brown and rainbow trout to provide a put and take fishery, but very few fish survived 
the summer because the summertime temperatures got to be so warm. Next slide. It wasn't until the 1985 Farm Bill, and this truly was a watershed, pun intended, uh, uh, effort. There was two things, cross compliance and the conservation reserve program. Cross compliance required producers who received any kind of a subsidy check to have and follow a conservation tillage plan on their farm, a first time requirement. And the, the CRP program idled up literally millions of acres with perennial vegetation uh, on what was previously row crop ground. And it wasn't until we started seeing the increased perennial vegetation on the landscape that we started to see major changes. Next slide, please. By the 1980s, we had more groundwater infiltration on the hillsides, resulting in more base flow and colder spring temperatures. Watercrest started to show up on the main streams, which had previously been uh, restricted to just some of the spring heads. Next slide. By the late 1980s, we were starting to find uh, more carryover of stock brown trout, and so fish were surviving from one year to the next. And for the first time, we were finding natural reproduction. So stream conditions were returning to a point where trout uh, brown trout could uh, spawn and reproduce and the young would carry over from one year to the next. Next slide. By the 1990s, streams that did not support brown trout in the 1960s, they had enough flow and temperature regimes that would again support brook trout. So we went on a brook trout a restoration program to try to get this native species reestablished into the local streams. Next slide. Uh, by 2010, when I retired, most of the streams in the four counties that I manage and naturally producing populations of both brook trout and brown trout. Uh, next slide. And by 2016, Trout Unlimited did an uh, economic study looking at the entire driftless area, and they found out that trout fishing is a $1.6 billion industry and growing. This includes you know, hotels, motels, guiding service, restaurants, the whole works. So it's not an insignificant industry where once did not where one did not exist just a few decades before. Next slide, please. And the gravest threat, as we're talking about today, climate change. And you can go to the next one, please, Robin. This is just a map of what the, the anticipation is if, if uh, the temperatures continue to increase, uh, the air temperatures continue to increase. The green is where you would find brook trout today. And you can see by the mid-century, those areas are pretty much gone. So for all intents and purposes, brook trout and probably a lot of brown trout would be removed from the, the entire state. Next slide. Um, and as we all know, we're having significant changes in the precipitation patterns in this state. Uh, and the climatologists can, can feel that this will probably continue for the near future. Uh, and you can skip to the next slide. I apologize for if these are taking long um, for on my side. Uh, I'm not seeing them because of my internet service. So next slide, please. And as we know, you have a lot of problems with flooding, infrastructure issues, and so forth. Uh, next slide. 
So how do we go from what's becoming the new normal? And the answer to that would be regenerative farming. More, more landscape or more vegetation on the landscape, a big difference. Next slide, please. It's not the cow, it's the how. And uh, what we're finding is that uh, grass-fed beef, animals that are grown on a grass landscape can actually reduce the carbon footprint in the, in this, in the world. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, this is what we, this is what, how most of the beef in our country is raised, most of the, uh, the livestock, and currently only four companies control 85% of the meat market. So when we talk about uh, methane uh, and um, issues occurring from cattle, this is a situation that we're talking about. What I'm proposing is something different. Next slide, please. What I'm looking at, what you're seeing here is a total grass based system. These are four different, two dairies and two beef cows or beef cattle, where the entire farm was once row crop and is now in a grass situation. So the cattle are fed on a grass based diet, no grains, no, uh, no uh, fertilizer, no pesticides, or herbicides, none of the things no manure runoff, none of the things that we associate with a traditional farming system. Next slide, please. So the, for, to, to increase profit, there's three ways of doing it. Increased production, that's not what we're talking about. We're not trying to get more animals. The pay price, the premium, that's gonna be market driven. So the grazers are able to reduce the cost of their production by up to 60%, which gives them more income per cow, more, cost, more, more profit per cow. Next slide, please. So basically what we're looking at is a really simple system. There's no anything other than the sun plus water plus grass and cows. Uh, so cows feed on the grass, they, uh, their manure fertilizes the grass, the grass uh, sequesters carbon, there is CO2 that is released, but then it's reabsorbed again into the, uh, from the atmosphere into, uh, into, the, uh, into the ground system. So we get a lot of, uh, next slide please. So things that we're looking at is increased uh, groundwater filtration, uh, building up of the soil, decreasing soil temperatures, reducing pesticide use, manure runoff, soil health. Uh, for every 1% of organic matter that you add to a, a soil, you can increase its holding ability 2,000 gallons per acre. This will make a big difference on our watersheds here where we're being subject to, to flooding. Just imagine if all the corn and soybean fields that you see around the, the country could be converted to, um, to grass base and get back to a system that existed at the time of settlement. Next slide, please. So this is what we're talking about. Animals that are absolutely a comfort. Uh, there's uh, a closed cycle process here and uh, with definite carbon sequestration and a definite improvement to the landscape and still allowing producers to make a living because as far as I, as far as I know, none of us are going to stop eating. So you can either end that one or the, have my next slide, Robin, thank you. Just any questions, you can find me there. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Um, I think we'll turn it over to um, Rob next. Okay, thanks. Uh, 
Like your slideshow, Dave. Nice job. I'm going to try to share my Thanks, screen Rob. now. Thank you, Rob. Is that working? <clears throat> yep. Okay. Um, great. Uh, climate actions in the Cooley region. Um, I'm Rob Tischer, um, representing Mississippi Valley Conservancy. Uh, just some background information about our organization. I think many of you know about this already, but perhaps not everybody. Our office is here in uh, the city of La Crosse. Uh, we were founded in 1997 by a group of about 10 people or so. Um, so this is our 25th year of uh, being in operation. We serve nine counties. Um, what we do according to our mission statement is we preserve bluffs, farmlands, wetlands, prairies, and streams of the driftless area for the health and well being of the future. So far to date, we've um, conserved um, a little over 22,000 acres in the last 25 years. Um, I mentioned we serve a nine county area. This gives you an idea about where these counties are, basically southwestern Minnesota from uh, the northern tier of counties in our area, Buffalo County and Trempeleau, all the way down to Grant County. <clears throat> um, MVC is a land trust, a conservation land trust. And um, what does that mean? How does, how does that enable us to preserve land or to conserve land? Um, there are over 40 land trusts in Wisconsin. Some are quite small, um, just are conserving a, a relatively small patch of land. Others are relatively large like uh, MVC. Um, Although land trusts can own, uh, be the, the, the official owner of a piece of property, uh, and in uh, NBC's case, we do own about uh, 5,000 acres, plus or minus. Uh, but our primary conservation tool is not to own property, but to work with private property owners and to establish conservation easements on these properties. To date, we've... Um, We've established about 120 conservation easements in our county area of uh, service, which amounts to a little bit over 15,000 acres. So most of our work is done with private landowners. Uh, so what is a conservation easement? It's a legally binding agreement um, that's established between a private landowner and uh, with uh, la uh, a land trust such as NBC. Um, it's initiated by the landowner. Um, landowner cannot be forced to do, to, to establish an easement. It's, it's a voluntary situation initi initiated by the landowner. Uh, this agreement <clears throat> spells out um, how the land is to be managed on into the future. It defines building sites, current building sites, perhaps future building sites, it defines where farm fields are or are not. It uh, defines where natural areas, woodlands are established, where prairies are and that sort of thing. Um, and after the easement has been established, it still remains private land under the ownership of the landowner. Uh, it's not open to the public unless for some reason the landowner wants it to be that way and most of our landowners do not. Um, so the easement defines these building sites and land use um, uh, patterns. This easement extends on into the future when the property is, is sold and purchased by another landowner, the conservation easement goes with the property. And folks from uh, NVC carefully work with these new land, landowners to familiarize uh, the new landowners with um, what the conservation easement says, how it's organized, how it works, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, personnel from the conservancy, staff members as well as volunteers, um, are obligated to uh, re to walk around or to fly over each property every year to verify that the uh, easement is still intact. That adjacent landowners haven't accidentally logged logged over onto the property, or landowners are uh, still following the easement as it was set up. 
So the, the, the um, conservancy is, is involved with setting up the conservation easement, but then perhaps even uh, as significantly, we are involved with managing the conservation easement on into the future. Um, I will mention that some of our easements do border urban areas. The, the best example of this would be uh, land owned by the city, uh, the Blufflands uh, here that are to the east of the city. Um, not all of this city owned land is covered by conservation easements, but, but about a thousand acres of these Bluffland areas that are owned by the city have a conservation easement that's been established by MVC. It's a partnership between the city and uh, MVC. So here's a uh, granddad bluff over here, for example, in the upper left part of the screen. So I, I don't think any here in um, this meeting has any doubt that the climate is in fact warming. Um, just to confirm that <laughs> that is the case, um, we have pretty good temperature records going back to the late 1800s when folks started recording temperatures in a fairly accurate way. Going on through the present point in time, um, on a worldwide basis, the temperature has increased about um, a little more than one degree Celsius, which is um, about two degrees Fahrenheit. Doesn't sound like much. Uh, two comments. Number one, temperature forecasts are such that temperature will increase, keep increasing uh, quite a bit more than this on into the future. And the second point is even small temperature increases can have uh, surprisingly large effects on, on nature. Uh, this map shows growth zones um, established by the USDA uh, as they existed in 1990. Um, so, for example, most of Wisconsin in 1990 was in growth zone four. The northern uh, tier of our counties was in growth zone three, slightly cooler. And maybe 20% or a little bit less of the state um, was covered by growth zone five. Going forward 25 years, you can see that all of these growth zones across the entire United States, across the entire continent, uh, uh, North America have, have moved northwards. Um, growth zone five now covers almost half of the state and um, growth zone three, which was in Northern Wisconsin no longer applies to the Northern counties. This is with only two degrees temperature change. Um, so it's significant, it's, it's happening. We, we cannot stop climate change we can uh, limit how much it occurs. And I think we all know uh, the cause of climate change. There is one quite simple overriding cause of climate change, and that is uh, increased CO2 concentration in the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels. Um, this graph shows the concentration of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere going back about almost a million years and then moving on to the right, we come up to the present point in time. And you can see the level of carbon dioxide has bounced around a fair amount over the past uh, 800,000 years, depending on ice ages, et cetera. But in the last uh, 70 years or so, the carbon dioxide concentration has just literally skyrocketed. We have not seen levels of uh, carbon dioxide in this atmosphere, uh, this high in, in the atmosphere for uh, quite some time. Uh, we have been apparently at levels comparable to this and perhaps even higher, but that was like 70 million years ago before uh, humans existed. Um, so this is, this is quite unusual. We have, we, humans have not been in this situation before. The overriding solution, stop burning fossil fuels. <laughs> Scientifically, that's simple. Uh, politically, and uh, from a societal perspective, it's, of course, more complicated, but it's a simple, simple cause, simple solution in that, from that perspective. So the essential critical step that's needed to slow climate change and to stop it is to simply drastically reduce the burning of fossil fuel switch to carbon-free energy sources. 
Um, again, this, from a from a technological scientific perspective, this is not that difficult. We we have technology in place to do this. Uh, politically, societally, we have we have to come up with the uh, uh, we have to get the ball rolling. And I, from my perspective, this needs to be a top down perspective uh, initiative from um, state government, uh, national government, world government leaders. Um, creating new policies and incentives, but it, it, it flows downhill to, uh, to us too, from the bottom up. Um, this, this slogan that I first became familiar with in the 1970s is, is that if you aren't part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Some of my friends say, well, we know what to do, but we're not really gonna change our lifestyle until uh, policies are in place that make it make incentives quite strong to do so. Uh, I keep coming back to this, this idea. If you are not, if we are not part of the solution, we're part of the problem. Uh, I'll just throw this out here. Last summer, we bought an electric car, uh, an EV car. Um, it's, it's remarkable, it exceeded our expectations. I'd love to talk about electric vehicles sometime in the future, just throw that out there. So MVC and climate change, what are we doing? Well, our basic mission is land conservation. And as I'll point out, uh, land conservation is a way of addressing climate change. It's, uh, it's considered to be a quote, natural solution uh, uh, to address climate change. Um, two parts to this uh, land conservation, natural solution idea. Uh, first part is conserving land, specifically the vegetation on the land, removes CO2 from the air, uh, sequesters CO2, takes it out of the atmosphere. So that's a way of directly addressing uh, CO2 excess in the atmosphere. The second uh, part of uh, land conservation is that Conserving land helps mitigate or manage the effects of climate change. It doesn't stop climate change, but it helps lessen the effects of climate change. So I'll briefly touch on these two approaches that MBC is involved with. So when we preserve natural areas or when natural areas are preserved, that means the, uh, the native land cover is preserved. And one thing plants are good at, and that is removing CO2 from the air. Um, this is a photograph of the uh, Cooley area, um, covered with, much of it, it's covered with uh, really great uh, forest, uh, stands of forest, big trees, capturing and storing much CO2 in plant biomass, um, above ground in, in tree trunks and branches, but as well as below ground and, and root and fungi and bacteria, rich, rich biosphere below ground it stores a heck of a lot of CO2. Um, much of the CO2 that's been produced by fossil fuels to date has been uh, removed from the air naturally in vegetation and particularly by the ocean. It has absorbed a fair amount of CO2 and soils have absorbed a fair amount of CO2 also. Um, uh, scientists suspect that we're reaching the limits um, at which uh, oceans and um, terrestrial ecosystems can continue absorbing the CO2. And indeed, much of it has accumulated in the atmosphere. But uh, preserving natural areas is one way of addressing climate change. If we don't preserve natural areas, for example, if we cut timber recklessly, uh, that removes nature's ability to absorb CO2 and the biomass that's removed ultimately is released as CO2 in the air, which simply exacerbates the problem. So preserving that, the first step in combating climate change is preserve what you have. Don't, don't destroy it. The second aspect uh, that MBC is relying on that uh, addresses climate change is restoration of natural areas. This is a farm field, a cornfield in um, Crawford County. There's about 50 acres to this, uh, this field. 
we stopped planting corn on it about uh, five years ago. And um, they seeded it with oak, with acorns. And uh, after a couple of years, uh, oak seedlings are uh, sprouting up and they put tubes to protect these seedlings as they're germinating and sprouting and becoming saplings. So in uh, 15, 25 years, we'll have a young forest there. In 50 years, we'll have uh, an oak savanna with magnificent large oak trees growing on that property. That captures biomass, takes it from the atmosphere, stores it in tree trunks and in root systems below ground. So restoring forest cover is an activity that we encourage our landowners to engage in. And we've been doing that a bit on our properties as well. Another aspect of um, restoration is restoring prairie vegetation. This is a 300 site um, close to Holman that was a farm field. Um, MVC purchased this property and uh, has planted it with native, native prairie vegetation, big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, and some interesting cool forbs. And it's been quite successful. The thing about prairies is the amount of biomass that's stored below ground. The root systems of these native prairie plants is surprisingly extensive. Fair amount of biomass above ground, but most of the biomass stored in uh, native prairies is below ground. These roots go down deep. They, uh, the organic matter accumulates in the soil, and uh, it's an excellent, excellent way of sequestering carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So, um, those are two ways that MVC is directly attacking, attacking the cause of climate change, that is removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Keep in mind, <laughs> it's going to require a whole lot more than that, but uh, those efforts do directly attack uh, climate change. But we also help manage the effects of climate change. We acknowledge that it's happening and we, we try to mitigate the effects of climate change. Um, Dave did a good job of introducing us to uh, the Driftless region. Um, I want to point out that uh, our 13 county service area, MVC's 13 county service area, is smack dab within the Driftless area. The Driftless area uh, is an area of exceptional topographic diversity, towering bluffs, 500, 600 feet tall, and uh, uh, deeply eroded uh, over the past stream valleys with cool streams and all sorts of uh, interesting habitats in between. Uh, an extraordinary amount of uh, topographical diversity, which generates an extraordinarily high level of habitat diversity. Habitat diversity, geographical diversity yields habitat diversity. This is a map produced by the Nature Conservancy of the Upper Midwest. Here's uh, Wisconsin. I don't know if you can see the, you can see the Lake Michigan here. Minnesota over here, uh, Iowa, Northern Illinois. This is the Driftless area. And the green areas in this uh, map are areas that have high diversity. So I don't know how clearly this is shown, but the Driftless area pops. It's, it's an extraordinarily high area of habitat diversity. Compared to Iowa, brown is low habitat diversity. These are the, the cornfields of Iowa and in, in Minnesota. The area of the central sands in, in Wisconsin, that's really low diversity, high agricultural areas. This area that we are located in, that NBC does its business in, is a jewel with respect to habitat diversity. Why is that important? Well, habitat that's diverse, um, provides climate friendly sanctuaries. We've got a range of temperatures, a range of soil conditions, a range of moisture conditions within the, within the uh, driftless area. We've got dry goat prairies for uh, prairie vegetation and, and, and uh, animals that like dry, warm areas. The backside of the bluffs are cooler with different, with more moisture, different composition of forests, of, of trees. Um, we have exposed bluff faces that get blasted with sun and that provides really interesting habitats for some uh, types of species. 
We have cool uh, groundwater fed streams, world-class trout stream, streams here that are cool with cool uh, coolie bottoms. So we have a really wide range of habitat conditions. It's like opening um, a hotel that offers all sorts of rooms that it can accommodate all sorts of strange and, and wonderful people. <laughs> um, we offer a, a wide variety of habitats that will provide sanctuary for plants and animals as they move forward to, to try to adjust their range to accommodate climate change. Um, as we uh, conserve areas in the driftless region, um, high habitat areas, we're cognizant of the fact that plants and animals will be moving through our areas as they move northward. So we try to protect habitat, high quality habitat in corridors so that plants and animals can have uh, continuous habitat as they adjust their ranges and, and basically uh, are moving northward, northward. So this is a map showing um, habitat corridors in the Kickapoo River uh, region. And um, we have um, conservation easements scattered through these corridor areas. It's our attempt to preserve these areas uh, to help plants and animals adjust their ranges to accommodate climate change. One other way that we help manage the effects of climate change that uh, stems from preserving um, natural vegetation is, as Dave pointed out, natural vegetation helps preserve, uh, it helps, help, helps capture rainwater to re recharge our groundwaters. It helps prevent soil erosion. Uh, we've had absolutely astounding rainfall events in the last several years. I, I keep coming back to that. I think it was a 12 inch rainfall in the Black Earth area, it's just unheard of. And um, by preserving uh, areas in the Cooley region that have steep topographies and are prone to erosion, by preserving these areas and their natural vegetation covers that will reduce soil erosion and will help capture rainwater, slow it down, help to recharge groundwaters. So to summarize, um, Mississippi Valley Conservancy uh, is preserving land, uh, conserving land, and that does address climate change. It addresses the cause of climate change, which is uh, excess CO2 in the atmosphere. It also helps manage the effects of climate change that is occurring and that will continue to occur for some time. It provides habitat corridors, uh, diverse habitat sanctuaries, Etc. In my opinion, it's um, because we live in the driftless area here, our MVC's largest contribution to climate change is managing the effects of climate change. The habitat diversity in this area is, is world class. And I think we need to, MVC realizes the value of conserving land in this area has, and I'm grateful to them. That's it. Thank you, Rob. So, um, so we're going to bring it back even more local now, and we're going to ask Jared to talk a little bit about the City of La Crosse Wastewater Treatment Plant and some of the innovations that are going on there, um, both as helping prevent climate change impacts and helping mitigate some climate change impacts. So, um, Jared, um, we're going to you now. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, thanks uh, for having me today. I really appreciate it. Uh, the two uh, presentations before mine really leads into what we're doing here at La Crosse as it relates to climate change. And as I've experienced in my career here at La Crosse, more intense rainfalls. I deal with street flooding, infrastructure failure. And then part of our upgrade is to better manage uh, reuse of our biosolids as we apply that on farm fields for reuse. So with that be, being said, uh, welcome to La Crosse Wastewater Treatment Plant. Again, my name is Jared Greeno. We're a regional wastewater treatment plant. What does that mean? Uh, we not only serve the city of La Crosse, we also serve the city of Onalaska, the town of Shelby, the town of Campbell, and La Crescent, Minnesota. So as Minnesota was faced in La Crescent with building a new wastewater treatment plant in about 2006, where they discharged into the marsh, 
uh, by La Crescent, uh, they needed to discharge their effluent into the West Channel. After looking at that expense, it made more sense to contract with the city of La Crosse. So we're a regional wastewater treatment plant. Uh, we're a wastewater utility. Uh, so basically we're funded through those uh, rates. So if you use water, you pay for treating this water. Here at the La Crosse Wastewater Treatment Plant, I'm gonna give you a little background on how we treat sewage here at the La Crosse Wastewater Treatment Plant. And then with our major upgrade that's underway, how we're gonna look at using, reusing uh, methane gas uh, to be 100% energy neutral and how we have minimal effects on the Mississippi River. So that being said, we serve 85,000 people. Uh, we treat 10 million gallons of sewage every day. Uh, so that flow into the plant doesn't stop. We have peaks and valleys, but the flow never stops. So at the head of the plant, we start filtering out any of the larger material like disposable wipes, rags, organics, plastics, cell phones, credit cards, Power Rangers, anything that might've been flushed that day. Then we start the, the travel through the system and we remove grit and sand from the system. And then we have settling tanks where we settle out uh, solids, almost 40% of our solids can be settled out in our primary clarifiers. But keep in mind, uh, the flows into the wastewater plant, we talk about sewage, 95% of it is water, which can be reused and discharged the Mississippi River. The other 5% is the organic solids, rags, plastics, things that have been filtered out. So as, as we settle out solids in our primary clarifiers, uh, we have what we call a primary effluent, which we pump to our activated sludge process. So if you can see my screen, this is an activated sludge process, which it's a BNR system, biological nutrient removal. So we're removing nutrients like phosphorus, nitrogen, before it's discharged to the Mississippi River. So currently, we're a biological treatment plant. We don't use chemical addition to treat the water before it goes to the Mississippi River. We truly create an environment in our activated sludge process to remove things like nitrogen, ammonia, and phosphorus. Uh, as you're all aware of, those are good fertilizers. If you wanna uh, raise a, a bigger crop or make your gra uh, grass greener at home, so once it goes through the BNR system, it goes to the final clarifiers where we settle out solids one more time. And that's where we settle out solids. It's called return activated sludge. That's the life cycle we've created to promote biological nutrient removal. And we recycle that to the head of this system. The water that flows over the weirs of these final clarifiers then flow through our UV building out to the Mississippi River. So at that point, it's low in nutrients. Uh, we do uh, use ultraviolet lighting to disinfect or kill that bacteria before it goes to the Mississippi River. So in a nutshell, that's the flow of the water through the plant. So biologically, we treat a drop of water within 18 hours. So it enters the plant. 18 hours later, that drop of water is discharged to the Mississippi River. Now the solids that we settle out on our clarifiers uh, we pump those to another tank called gravity thickeners where we settle it out to remove more water. Those solids then are pumped to our anaerobic digesters. So our anaerobic digesters is where a few things happen. Uh, we get a 40 to 60% reduction in volatile solids. Well, what does that mean? Well, if we put 100 gallons of sludge in the tank, uh, we break it down, convert it to methane gas, and the other 50% uh, where we reduce the volume by 50%. Now the methane that we currently produce, uh, we burn it in heat exchangers to heat the sludge to 95 degrees. By heating it to 95 degrees, we get a redu reduction in solids and we get a reduction in pathogens that are in the solids. Once it's spent 15 days in digestion, now the extra methane, we currently flare it off but I'm gonna come back and talk about how we're gonna reuse that extra methane that we produce. So then we pump it to a piece of equipment called uh, uh, sludge thickening or gravity belt thickener. Currently, we thicken the solids to remove water. Uh, the solids then go to our blue storage tanks, uh, which is uh, biosolid storage, we call it. Uh, there we reuse our biosolids as fertilizer. 
So we haul, currently haul 13 million gallons annually to farm fields injected into the soil and the farmers get it as free fertilizer as a beneficial reuse. We have 6,500 acres in La Crosse County that's permitted by the Department of Natural Resources where we can reuse biosolids as fertilizer. We have 1,600 acres permitted uh, in the state of Minnesota for reuse. So in a nutshell, that's the flow of the water through the plant and how we reuse biosolids as fertilizer. And we've done it for 80 years or better. This wastewater plant was built in 1936. Prior to 1936, there was no treatment of sewage in La Crosse. It was discharged straight to the Mississippi River, which wasn't good for the environment. We've done major upgrades in the 50s, 1970s, when the Clean Water Act was passed. We did some major upgrades in 1999. Uh, currently, we're under a $65 million upgrade, which sounds like a huge dollar amount, which it is. It's the largest city project ever that the city has under, underwent. But in the end, we're going to be 100% energy neutral. Uh, $65 million does sound like a lot of money. We're able to spread that out over the users. So if I say our rates are going up 40%, that sounds really bad. If I say it's going up $8 a month, doesn't sound so bad. Uh, we'll still have one of the lowest rates in the state of Wisconsin. So over the years, we've done something right. So the office I sit in was built in 1936. The infrastructure here at the wastewater plant, we've taken care of it over the years. Anaerobic digesters built in 1960 or 1936 and 53, we're still using those digesters and they're still going to produce methane gas for us. So as part of our major upgrade, so the utilities, including water utility to pump the water into the distribution system and to treat sewage and pump it to the plant, uh, the utilities use 50% of the entire city's energy. That includes electricity, natural gas, diesel fuel, and gasoline. So we're energy hogs uh, here at the wastewater plant and for the city. But with our upgrade, we're going to be producing more methane. And down here, you'll see a biosolids uh, heat dryer building and also biogas to electricity. So we're going to burn our extra methane and the wastewater plant will become 100% energy neutral. Uh, the other thing that we're working with currently with XL Energy is we, the city, I should say, owns the whole island. Uh, we're gonna create a microgrid and have enough electricity to power the entire island. So that's all gonna happen by the spring of 2024. So that's not that far out. So I think we're heading in the right direction. What, did dro what drove us to this major upgrade? Well, here we have a filter building. So we contribute phosphorus to the Mississippi River. Well, our limit is one milligram per liter. So we have an agreement with DNR, we call it a permit, uh, which has a limit. And that limit for phosphorus at one time was one milligram per liter. Biologically, we can achieve 0.35 milligrams per liter on a daily basis, really easy, uh, with no chemical addition. Our new limit will be 0.1 milligram per liter. So to go from 0.35 to 0.1, we have to add filtration. So this is a filter built building where we'll filter out phosphorus or particles uh, in our effluent before it's discharged the Mississippi River. So basically our water, when we're done treat, treating it, it's not drinkable, but it's pretty darn close. Um, that's a hard one to sell though. I'm not that good at marketing to put it back into the system for re reuse. But with the upgrade that's compliance driven where our, our phosphorus limit is lowered. Uh, we've been planning this for a long time. So I've been here since 2007. I was part of facility planning in 2009. Again, in 2015, we started looking at low level phosphorus compliance, how we were gonna meet that new limit. What, is it trading agreements? Is it stream bank restoration? Is it buffer strips? Because I come from that farming background where uh, we've done conservation practices in the past, reduce phosphorus or runoff in the agricultural areas to have a minimal impact. We found that that was a little bit harder to navigate 
and you would have to continuously have maintenance agreements in place. The filtration is 100% guaranteed. Looking back at it for other contaminants that may be coming down the line, pharmaceuticals, PFAS, uh, this is gonna be money well spent uh, for filtering our effluent discharge to the Mississippi River. So we're under construction to install the disk filter to meet that new low level phosphorus compliance uh, component that we have coming by 2025. Now we talked about climate change. We talked about increased um, rainfall, heavier rainfall events. Uh, me with my farming background, you'd think uh, disposing of biosolids is simple and easy, right? Uh, I found that to be the most challenging, flood mitigation and biosolids, uh, Mississippi River coming out of its, you know, coming up on higher flood stages, lacrosse river flooding. I've dealt with all that in the last 10 years, more than I'd care to. So biosolids management, when it's wet, it's wet. So we have extra rainfall. I report it to the DNR on an annual basis. Yep, we have more rainfall, data shows it. So the fields are wetter in the spring, they're wetter in the fall. So we, when we dispose of or reuse biosolids, we inject it into the soil before planting in the spring. But uh, farmers can plant more acres and they can plant faster. Uh, the genetics of the seed can tolerate the colder temperatures. So we have to dispose of a thousand semi-loads in the spring before planting. And then another thousand semi-loads after harvest in the fall. And as it was wetter and wetter and wetter, we met with our facility designers in 2018, looking at different ways to manage our biosolids. So we looked at a heat dryer. And the main reason we looked at it as a heat dryer is we'd like to market our biosolids as class A fertilizer, similar to Milwaukee. They have what they call milorganite. I'm still working on the marketing strategy. I thought I'd call it Greeno's granulars, you know, and it has a nice ring to it maybe, but I'm sure there's some liability issue there. So we're gonna market it as class A fertilizer. Uh, the farmers can apply it, you know, whether it be on alfalfa, soybeans, uh, corn, and apply it when they need to, not when we have to. It gives us more flexibility. We can market that, you know, over the United, over Wisconsin, the state versus locally, gives us a broader area to reuse it. As we move towards the heat dryer, thinking outside the box a little bit, how can it be reused as energy? There's a couple of partners in the area where biomass is burned to create electricity or create heat and electricity. So we've trialed uh, heat dried biosolids, burning it in furnaces to create power. It will burn hotter than wood chips and it can be an alternative source of energy. Uh, we're not quite, uh, we haven't shored up those agreements or shored up how we're exactly gonna do that. But if it doesn't happen, we're ready to move to the next step here at Lacrosse to put in a furnace to draw, uh, burn heat dried biosolids, capture the heat and electricity off of because the heat can spin a turbine to create electricity. So it's just another avenue for reuse of biosolids uh, using our methane that we currently flare off, take in high strength waste from dairies or breweries in the area to create more methane gas in our digesters. You know, currently we clean sand and grit and reuse that at Lacrosse County Landfill as alternative daily cover. We have clean effluent that goes to the Mississippi River, which is cleaner than the Mississippi River. So when we conduct, you know, tours here of the wastewater plant, we have samples of uh, our effluent and we have samples of the Mississippi River. Ours is much cleaner than the river. And if you were to test it for nutrients like phosphorus or nitrogen, nitrogen ammonia, it would be uh, lower. We have uh, biosolids that are reused uh, as fertilizer out on the farm fields. So even before the upgrade, you know, we're taking care of the environment. The environment is important to the city of La Crosse. With my agricultural background, it's important to take care of the land, the soil, uh, what you impact around you. So even before the upgrade, we're really a, a reuse center. You know, maybe we're not a wastewater plant. Maybe we're uh, 
a reuse plant, you know, and even into the future when we become 100% energy neutral, it's a, it's a big milestone for the city of La Crosse. City of La Crosse Council passed a couple of years ago to be 100% energy neutral by 2050. We've done our part here at the La Crosse Wastewater Treatment Plant, you know, and its counterparts before myself and good consulting firms that can help us get to this point. Uh, we're pretty excited about this upgrade. It's really positive for uh, the region, the area. Uh, not only do we treat sewage uh, from uh, the region and serve 85,000 people, we also accept uh, 7 million gallons of truck waste uh, on an annual basis, whether that be septic tanks, holding tanks, tree strap waste. Uh, we have 12 industries that we uh, permit and regulate as industries, City Brewery, Quick Trip, Great Lakes Cheese. We have a a lot of things that we do here at the wastewater plant that is unseen, not known about. We regulate 33 dental offices to control uh, mercury, part of our mercury minimization uh, program. Uh, we also regulate large industries like chart train company to make sure uh, metals are not an issue. So we truly do produce high quality biosolids, high quality effluent, uh, we have our on-site laboratory that tests that on a daily basis. We report it to DNR. But I believe that we're heading in a, a good direction here at the La Crosse uh, Wastewater Treatment Plant. So in a nutshell, and being aware of the timeline that we're on, in a nutshell, that's what we do here at the La Crosse Wastewater Treatment Plant. And feel free to reach out to me by email. Give me a phone call. I'm uh, more than happy to conduct tours, uh, but we are under a major upgrade here at the treatment plant, and we think we're heading in a great direction. Thank you. Thanks, Jared. You're welcome. I think if you could stop um, screen share. Absolutely. Then we'll go into uh, questions. We've got some questions that have come in. Did it stop sharing? Oh, there we go. Got it. There you go. That looks better. Um, so the first question um, I'd like to ask um, Dave. Um, Dave, when you talk about the regenerative, regenerative agriculture um, as it comes to grazing, can you talk a little bit about like um, the quantity uh, of, of animals that could be raised that way and especially not only um, beef cattle, but also dairy cattle. I, I, my, my question is twofold. One, we have a question about um, the quantity of beef that's eaten by Americans in, in general. And the other question I have is also about the quantity of cheese because it takes so much milk to produce cheese. And we've come quite used to having um, ample artisan cheeses in this area. So just kind of your thoughts about how that works. Okay, well, to take your second one first, the cheese is an interesting one. Right now, most of the dairy cattle, when you look around, those are Holsteins, they're black and white. They're designed, they're bred to produce a tremendous amount of milk, but they're really low in, in butter fat. And so they make really poor cheese. And so grazers, because they want to keep their butter fat content up, you'll see a lot of grazers, I don't know if you remember the slide, but there was a lot of brown cattle. So it'd be brown Swiss, jerseys, things like that, that are higher in, in butter fat. And so many of the grazers are able to produce a premium milk uh, that's much higher in omega-3s, uh, much higher in the, uh, the cheese making components. And so there are grazers that actually have cheese plants on their farm and they take all of their milk and convert it, convert it to cheese. Uh, the other thing about going with managed grazing is it allows you a much easier uh, window or, or opportunity to get into organics because you're already grazing, you're already not using herbicides, pesticides, some of the other things that the conventional dairy is using. And so to go into a premium milk, that's where the higher the milk prices come, is a much easier, much easier conversion. Um, the other thing that I want to mention about managed grazing is that I know one of the questions was about Bacon Fest, which is an interesting, interesting because 
it sort of depends. You can graze pigs, you can graze chickens, you can obviously graze sheep, goats, cattle. And so just imagine that if, when you drive around, not just in this state, but across the Midwest, 60% of the corn and soybean fields that you see go for animal feed. The rest, the other 40% goes to ethanol. And I don't know about you, but for me to create, to spend a whole bunch and burn up a whole bunch of fossil fuel to create ethanol, to reduce our use of fossil fuel, I, somehow I don't get it. The, the loop doesn't work for me. But the, if you could take 60% of that crop that's now being used for animal feed and convert that to grass, you would have all of the benefits. You'd still be able to raise the, the same amount of cattle. Actually, you could raise more cattle because with the managed grazing, because of the, the uh, quality of the feed, you could actually have more head on a smaller basis. The difference is, is that as I saw in the feedlot, those cattle are there 24 seven, 365 days. On a managed grazing system, the cattle are rotated off these small paddocks and they generally are not returned for a month to uh, you know, 30 to 35 days. So the cattle are only taking the top, the best quality feed off of that and then the paddock is allowed to rest. Their manure breaks down, the soil builds up, you know, all of the, the micronutrients, all the whole biome that occurs in the soil is allowed uh, to reproduce and replenish. And so there never is a point on a well-managed grazing system where the soils are destroyed, the biome in the soil is destroyed or anything else happens. It's, it's truly is a loop system where sun, plus you know cattle plus grass. I mean, that's, that's basically it. So if you could imagine, uh, um, when you look at dairy farms, even dairy farmers can do this. And there are a number of dairy farms. Joe Tamandel, who runs the dairy grazing apprenticeship, he has three farms. Uh, he has about 300 heads. So he's a smaller operation, but he is, because of his cost per unit, his cost per hundred weight, is so much less, he's actually making a profit, which you know anything about agriculture, I know it's been talked about, profit in agriculture just don't seem to be, not be the same, so. Well, and also if you Google um, smoked coconut, it actually tastes a lot like bacon, so um, <laughs> there's alternatives to well, <laughs> And then, you know, there's, there's a big push, you know, everybody's saying, well, you know, you can eat the meatless burgers. Well, that's soybean. You're still looking at a monoculture. You still have to include every single calorie of uh, or every single gallon of fossil fuels that is spent to plant the, you know, everything. You have to look at the entire system. You know, sometimes corn farmers say, well, it's a really interesting system. You just plant the corn seed and the sun and the rain. No, no, no. You have to include every gallon of diesel fuel, every gallon of fossil fuels that was used to create the fertilizer, to plant, to transport, everything that's involved in that. And then when you start looking at that, it's not as good of a system as it is now, or as, as, it, should, as it could be. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dave. Um, a question sure. for, for Jared. Um, Jared, uh, does the um, city of La Crosse coordinate with the health department um, to look for um, COVID specimens in our in our wastewater? Absolutely. When we started uh, down the COVID path, uh, what two years ago now, a little over two years ago, we started with uh, Gunderson Health System, and we're working with the University of Wisconsin, uh, monitoring our influence for SARS and COVID virus. And, and the same thing um, you mentioned, uh, PFAS, um, are you able to test your biosolids um, to ensure that they're PFAS free? We can do that. Uh, we haven't done that yet uh, just because of uh, lawsuits that are in place. Okay. Do you have, can you test in-house or do you have to send that out if you were to? Uh, testing for PFAS is very sensitive. So you have to decontaminate your body before you collect a sample uh, to measure PFAS, and that means uh, no uh, soap, 
no shampoo, no laundry soap on your clothes for five days prior to collecting a sample to measure for PFAS. It's that sensitive when you're talking parts per trillion. So we'd use an outside source. Excellent. A, a question for um, for Rob. Rob, with the Mississippi Valley Conservancy, um, are you seeing um, uh, like the level of participation? I know that your organization is highly respected in this area, um, but because these are permanent easement, easements, um, are you still seeing uh, an interest in landowners to want to contribute towards um, your uh, your efforts? Um, apparently, yes. We have a long, long waiting list, and um, our issue is to prioritize requests. Um, we have a, a minimum acreage cutoff of, I believe it's 40 acres, and we, we do go, go below that if it's a high um, conservation value piece of property, uh, but we do prefer to work with larger landowners. But I, last I heard, I think we had at least 50 to 100 people on our waiting list. So interest is still quite high. I don't think we've seen that to fall back at all. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Uh, I, I, another question for um, Jared. Um, Jared, can you, two questions about, um, one about um, biosolids um, and whether or not if you test for those um, before, um, uh, or would you be testing before that um, uh, materials go out as fertilizer? And then can you tell us about microplastics and are they filtered out through our system? Absolutely. So the EPA and the state of Wisconsin DNR has uh, set up high quality standards for high quality biosolids. We meet those standards. So we're testing for heavy metals. Uh, we're testing for fecal coliform for pathogens present. We know the nutrient content. Our application rates are based on nitrogen, so we don't want to over apply nitrogen. Uh, phosphorus, we don't have a magic wand to make phosphorus disappear. Uh, we capture it from the affluent, it ends up in our biosolids, and that's another good reason maybe to burn heat dried biosolids because we, we capture phosphorus, it's in our biosolids, uh, we haul it out to the farm fields, which are already in this area rich in phosphorus which eventually won't all be used up, but eventually end up in our waterways anyway. So we'll be able to basically short circuit that cycle of phosphorus. Um, there is some technologies that are getting advanced to remove phosphorus, but yes, our biosolids that are reused out on the farm fields are highly scrutinized and we measure that uh, every month, uh, report it to DNR to make sure we know what we're applying on those farm fields. And the second question on that was for me. Microplastics. Yeah, microplastics, it's, we don't have a way to remove that here at the plant. Our new filtration system will. Um, it's more like mercury minimization, educating the public, you know, making some of the manufacturers aware of this problem, which I think is maybe helping and going in the right direction related to microplastics. The new filters will filter it out. Uh, which ends up on our biosolids. So again, we don't have the technology to harvest that out to reuse it, but we're going to have a better control mechanism in place. Awesome, thank you. Well, Mary, I see we're coming up on to one o'clock. I was wondering if you had some closing comments that you wanted to make. Certainly. Um, thank you, Robin. And I want to say thank you to Ellen and Carolyn and Dave, Rob and Jared. It's so fitting that we end our program this year recognizing the issue that affects all of us and no matter what our politics are. I also want to extend a thank you. Um, let me share this. Here we go. Thank you to all of our program attendees. This year we've dealt with issues concerning our community, state, and country and your participation is and involvement is very, very much appreciated. If you have ideas for topics for next year's Lunch and Learn programs, please share them with us. We're planning to be back at the waterfront using a hybrid model on the second Tuesdays of the month. Also, 
be watching for more information on the June 9th annual meeting. We will again be virtual. However, we need your input in planning our 2022 to 2023 year. Thank you again to everyone for a great year and a special thank you to Robin for her leadership. So until June, stay safe, stay warm. Unfortunately, it's coming up again and stay well. Thank you.